there, BCPS mathematicians. My name is Mrs. Potter, and I'm your host for this week's episode of Algebra 1 BCPS TV Style. You might be noticing that things look a little bit different this week. Welcome to my virtual classroom. I'm excited to be your teacher today. Let's get started. For the past two weeks, we've heard some very important math messages from Dr. Joe Bowler, a professor at Stanford University. We learned that everyone is capable of learning math at high levels and that exercising your brain is so important. We also learned the difference between a growth and a fixed mindset. Having a growth mindset means that you persist and keep going even when things are hard. This week, we're going to learn about mistakes. Let's see what Dr. Bowler and her students have to say. Something else we now know from brain research is that struggle and mistakes are really important. A research study found that when people made mistakes, their brains grew more than when they got work right. Surely they had to work through the problem and get it right in order for their brains to grow. Actually, no. The study found that there were two possible synapse firings. The first comes when you make a mistake, and the second one comes if and when you're aware you've made a mistake. But how can your brain grow if you don't know you've made a mistake? Well, the best knowledge we have on this is your brain grows when you make a mistake because it's the time that the brain is challenged and is struggling. And those are the best times for brain growth. It can feel hard as a math student to struggle and fail. We've, We've all, all had, had that experience. experience. But now you can feel good about the struggle because you know your brain is growing. The most successful people in life are not the ones born with better brains. They're the ones who keep going when things get hard. Michael Jordan is one of the world's greatest basketball players. This is what he has said about the importance of struggle and failure. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times, I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. So now you know that Making mistakes are a really important part of learning. When you make a mistake, your brain is challenged and has to struggle, but it also makes your brain stronger. So this week, if you encounter a challenging problem or you make a mistake, don't forget that that's an important part of learning and you shouldn't give up. Let's go back to my virtual classroom and get started with a think about it task. This think about it task is asking you to notice and wonder about the graphs and equations listed in the chart below. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Let's take some time to hear what my family has to say about what they notice and what they wonder about graphs and equations A, B, and C. Hi, Finley. Hello. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. What do you notice about um, graph and equations A, B, and C? Uh, well, I noticed that the graphs have different uh, blue lines intersecting them in equa graph A, it's intersecting at two points, the graph B, it's intersecting at the vertex, and in graph C, it's just not even crossing the, the green line. The green and curve, you mean? The green curve, which okay. is the, I assume, the equations, a graphical representation of the equations. Okay. I also noticed that the left-hand side of each of the equations are the same. And I wonder why it results in different graphs when the right side is different. Okay, well, we're going to learn about that in our lesson for today. Yeah, lead in the lesson here. Nice. Thanks, Ben. I'm awesome. Hey there, Tim. Hey there, Laura. How you doing? I'm doing swell. What do you notice and what do you wonder about graphs and equations A, B, and C? Uh, well, I, I was thinking about this for a while. I was looking at them for a little bit of, of a long time. And I notice that the green graph is the same on all of the displays, all of the plots. And the blue dotted line is different on each one. And when I look down at the algebraic representation, I see the left-hand side is always the same and the right-hand side is different. So I wonder if there's a meaning between the fact that the green plots are the same and the equations are the same, and the blue dots are different, and the right-hand side constant is different. So we're actually going to be learning about the different types of solutions that quadratic equations can have. And so that is actually important for today's lesson. Thanks for noticing and wondering. Yep, you're welcome. 
The material covered in this first mini lesson is the same as the material in your print packet for the week of May 25th. This is lesson number one. Today, we will apply the quadratic formula in order to solve quadratic equations. You know a lot of different ways already to solve quadratic equations. You can solve quadratic equations by graphing. You can solve them by factoring, taking square roots, completing the square. But when those don't work or you want to try a different strategy, you can apply the quadratic formula. Let's learn about it. Before we start with our learn about it, I want to ask everyone to make sure they have a copy of their print packet for this week. The reason why I want you to have your print packet is so that you can take notes and review the examples that I go through throughout the lesson. As I mentioned when I unpacked the learning objective, you've learned several ways to solve quadratic equations in previous lessons. In many cases, a connection was made to a graphical representation of that equation. And here's a list of the different methods that we've learned. Factoring in the zero product property, using square roots, and completing the square and using square roots. So today, we're going to learn about a fourth strategy actually a fifth strategy if you include graphing, called the quadratic formula. Basically, if you're given a quadratic equation written in the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, you can apply the quadratic formula and find the values of x that make that equation true. The quadratic formula is x equals the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by the quantity 2 times a. Let's take a look at some examples to see how the quadratic formula can be applied. In this first example, I'm asked to solve the equation x squared plus x minus 20 equals 0 by using the quadratic formula. My math will be on the left-hand side of the screen, and my justifications will be on the right-hand side of the screen. The first thing I'm asked to do is make sure the equation is in the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, which is the standard form of a quadratic equation. It is, and I'm going to rewrite it here just so I have a copy of that. So x squared plus x minus 20 equals 0. Next, I need to identify a, b, and c so that I can substitute those values into the quadratic formula. a is equal to 1 because that's the coefficient of the x squared term, b is equal to 1 because that's the coefficient of the x term, and c is equal to negative 20 because that's the constant term. My next step is to substitute the values into the quadratic formula. I have a catchy jingle that I like to use to help me remember the quadratic formula. Here's how it goes. x equals the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So let's substitute those a, b, and c values into the quadratic formula. We're going to need a nice long fraction bar. So x is equal to the opposite of b, my b term was 1, plus or minus the square root of b squared, b was 1, minus 4 times a times c. My a value is 1, and my c value was negative 20. And that's all being divided by 2 times a, or 2 times 1. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin simplifying uh, this equation so it becomes more and more clear to me what my values of x are that satisfy the original equation. So first, I'm going to simplify the first term. The opposite of 1 is negative 1. Now I'm going to evaluate the squared term. 1 squared is 1. Now I'm going to evaluate 4 times 1 times negative 20. 4 times 1 times negative 20 is negative 80, so I'm subtracting negative 80. And I'm dividing that by 2 times 1, which is 2. To do some further simplification, I can simplify the expression that's underneath the radical symbol. Negative 1 plus or minus the square root 1 minus negative 80 is 81. So my, equ my equation and my solutions are now in the form x equals negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 81 divided by 2. Now I can evaluate the square root. The square root of 81 is 9. Remember, 9 squared is equal to 81, and squaring and taking the square root are inverse operations of each other. So I can rewrite my equation as x equals negative 1 plus or minus 9 divided by 2. My next step is to separate this equation into two equations, one that has the plus part and one that has the minus part. Let me show you what I mean. 
x equals negative 1 plus 9 divided by 2, and x is equal to negative 1 minus 9 divided by 2. So when I simplify the right-hand side of each of those equations, I'll get my solutions. So negative 1 plus 9 is 8 divided by 2 is 4, and negative 1 minus 9 is negative 10 divided by 2 is negative 5. So my two solutions are x equals 4 and x equals negative 5. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect these solutions to a graphical representation. And what I'm going to do to do that is I'm going to graph two parts of the two parts of this equation. I'm going to graph the left-hand side of the equation, y equals x squared plus x minus 20, and I'm going to graph y equals 0. So let's take a, take a look and see how the solutions to the equation y equals, I'm sorry, the solutions to the equation x squared plus x minus 20 equals 0 show up graphically. So remember, I'm going to graph y equals x squared plus x minus 20, so that gives me a parabola. And I'm also going to graph y equals 0. And when I do that, I'm going to take a look at the points of intersection. And you can see on my graph that the points of intersection are negative 5, 0, and 4, 0. The x-coordinate of the points of intersection are the same as the solutions to the quadratic equation. In our next example, example number 2, we're going to solve the equation x squared minus 6x plus 8 equals negative 1 by using the quadratic formula. The first thing we need to do is make sure our equation is in standard form, which is ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. This equation is not in standard form, but I can add one to both sides to help take care of that. So my equivalent equation is x squared minus 6x plus 9 equals 0. And now I can identify my a, b, and c values. a is 1 because that's the coefficient of the x squared term b is equal to negative 6 because that's the coefficient of the x term, and c is 9 because that's the constant term. Now I'll substitute my a, b, and c values into the quadratic formula. I have x is equal to the opposite of b, and b was negative 6, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so I have negative 6 squared minus 4 times a times c. My a value was 1, and my c value was 9. And that's all going to be divided by 2 times 1. So my next step is to begin the simplification process so that I can illuminate the solutions to the quadratic equation. So I'll start by simplifying the first term. The opposite of negative 6 is positive 6, plus or minus the square root the quantity negative 6 squared is 36 minus 4 times 1 times 9. 4 times 1 times 9 is 36, all divided by 2 times 1, which is 2. So I'm going to um, evaluate the expression underneath the square root symbol. So I have 6 plus or minus the square root of 0 divided by 2. The square root of 0 is 0, so my resulting equation is x equals 6 plus or minus 0 divided by 2. So I'm going to write my plus equation and my minus equation to find my solutions. So I have x equals 6 plus 0 divided by 2. 6 plus 0 is 6 divided by 2 is 3. And I have x equals 6 minus 0 divided by 2. 6 minus 0 is 6, divided by 2 is 3. So my solution is x equals 3, and we can see that it comes up more than once, so I can say it's a repeated solution. And now I'm going to check to see if the graphical representation of my equation matches the algebraic solution that I just found. So to do that, I'm going to graph two equations. I'm going to graph the equation y equals x squared minus 6x plus 8, and I'm going to graph y equals negative 1. And we'll look for the points of intersection, and we're going to make sure that those happen at x equals 3. So let's graph those two equations. My first equation was y equals x squared minus 6x plus 8. So I have a parabola there. And my other equation was y equals negative 1. 
I'm going to take a look at the point of intersection and I find that the X coordinate of the point of intersection is three, which was the same as the solution to the equation that I found algebraically. In example number three, I'm asked to solve the equation 2x squared minus 6x equals negative 15 by using the quadratic formula. I first need to check to see if the equation is in the standard form of a quadratic, which is x squared ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. This equation is not in that form, but I can put it in that form by adding 15 to both sides. That will make the right-hand side of the equation equal to zero. So my resulting equation, which is an equivalent form of the original equation, is 2x squared minus 6x plus 15 is equal to zero. Now I can find my a, b, and c values, which will allow me to evaluate the quadratic formula. a is equal to 2 because that's the coefficient of the x squared term. b is equal to negative 6, that's the coefficient of the x term. And c is equal to 15, that's the constant term. So now let's substitute the values into the quadratic formula. I think that fraction bar should be long enough. I have x is equal to the opposite of b, so I have the opposite of negative 6 plus or minus the square root of the quantity negative 6 squared minus 4 times a times c. a was 2 and c was 15. And that's all being divided by 2 times 2. So let's start the simplification process on the right side of the equation. First, I'm going to simplify the first term. The opposite of negative 6 is positive 6, plus or minus the square root. The quantity negative 6 squared is 36, minus 4 times 2 times 15. So I'm going to multiply 2 times 15 together to get me 30, and then multiply that by 4 to get me 120. So I have 36 minus 120 all divided by 2 times 2, which is 4. So let's evaluate what's underneath the um, square root symbol or the radical symbol. So I have 6 plus or minus the square root of negative 84 divided by 4. So the next step is to evaluate the square root. The square root of negative 84 is not a real number. So what that means about my final solution is that there are no real solutions to this quadratic equation. But I think it's really important that we take a look and see how this algebraic representation connects to the graphical representation. So let's take a look at what I'm going to be graphing. I'm going to be graphing two equations, the first one being y equals 2x squared minus 6x, and the other equation is y equals negative 15. And we'll see what happens. So my first equation was y equals 2x squared minus 6x, so it's a parabola. My other equation was y equals negative 15. Oops, that's not even on the graph, so let me adjust the window a little bit. So you can notice that there are no points, oops, there are no points of intersection between the green parabola and the purple um, linear relationship. And so that's why um, I can say that there are no real solutions to this quadratic equation from a graphical perspective and from an algebraic express perspective when we found that um, we had the square root of a negative number that shows us that there are no real solutions. In the try it portion of your print packet, you'll have an opportunity to practice solving equations by using the quadratic formula. There are six problems that are provided for you, but we only want you to pick four problems to try. And you're going to solve those equations by applying the quadratic formula. Here's an example x squared plus 2x minus 35 equals 0. Remember, our first step is to make sure that our quadratic equation is written in standard form. We're going to identify our a, b, and c values, and there's a nice little graphic here so that you can just write those in. And then you're going to substitute those values into the quadratic formula. And here's another little graphic that can help um, provide you with support as you work through these problems. Good luck, and make sure that you remember, if you make a mistake, that's okay. That's how your brain gets stronger. Way to go, mathematicians. Today, we practiced applying the quadratic formula in order to solve quadratic equations. Nice job. 
Make sure you take some time to try the try it problems in your print packet for this week. Remember, exercising your brain is how your brain grows. All right, mathematicians, let's transition to our next learning outcome by doing a think about it task. This think about it task is a which one doesn't belong. On the screen, there are four equations, equations A, B, C, and D. And your job is to identify which equation you think doesn't belong. It's also important to make sure that you have a reason why you think that equation doesn't belong. So take a minute, which one do you think doesn't belong and why? Let's hear what some of the members of the Potter family have to say about which equation they think doesn't belong. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Which equation do you think doesn't belong? I think equation D does not belong because all of the other equations have an x squared, whereas equation D has parentheses and then squared. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Lily. Hi. Which equation do you think doesn't belong? I think equation B doesn't belong because it's the only one that equals zero. And then the other equations equal... Numbers greater than zero. Like 72, 20, and 49? Yeah. Nice. I bet that will help us decide which uh, method to use when we're solving that equation. Hi, Spencer. Hi. Which equation do you think doesn't belong? I think equation A does not belong. Why? Uh, all the other equations have, an, have an, the x variable, or just x. Okay. Just, uh, just x. And this one has what? And an a value of 2. Oh. And the other ones don't have an a value. Well, they have an A value. What's the A value? One. Okay. And this, and you're saying that the equation A doesn't have an X term in it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I see and that my too. My wording was a little bad, but that's okay. you got the gist of it. So that's okay. okay. That's your rough draft thinking. Thanks, Frank. Yep. Yeah, no problem. Our second learning objective for this week's episode is on your screen. Today, we're going to use the best method based on the structure of a quadratic equation in order to solve the equation. This material is the same as the material in your print packet during the week of May 25th, and this is lesson two. So let's get started and see how we decide which is the best method to use to solve a quadratic equation. In this lesson, you will decide which method to use to solve quadratic equations. Note that some equations can be solved using more than one method. It is possible for quad quadratic equations to have two real solutions, one real repeated solution, or no real solutions. The graphic organizer summarizes the different methods for solving quadratic equations that you have learned so far. So let's take a look at that graphic organizer. We've learned lots of methods to solve quadratic equations. We've learned the factoring and the zero product property. That was during the week of May 11th. We solved quadratic equations using square roots. That was during the week of May 18th. We completed the square and used square roots also from the week of May 18th. And we applied the quadratic formula to solve quadratic equations. And that was from just the previous lesson that we just did. So let's take a look at each of the different factoring methods as a review, but also as a way to help us see how the structure of an equation might help us decide which strategy to use. So when we use the factoring method, they have to be in the form ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. We're looking for two numbers that multiply together to get us a times c and that add to give us b. We can then factor by grouping or use the box method to rewrite the equation in factored form. And then you apply the zero product property to find the solutions to your equation. When you use the square root method, you're going to isolate the squared term by using inverse operations and taking the square root. So the equations might look like this, ax squared plus c equals k, or a times the quantity x minus h squared equals k. When we complete the square, we're looking for a quadratic expression that's in the form ax squared plus bx plus c that we're going to complete the square for. And remember, completing the square means to find a value of c that creates a perfect square trinomial. You have to make sure that when you add a value of c to one side that you add it to the other side or add it to both sides of the equation. And then you're going to use square roots to isolate the squared term and find the solution. And last but not least, we have the quadratic formula, which we just talked about. And that also is applied when a quadratic equation is in the form ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. And remember, the quadratic formula is x equals the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. Remember, there's more than one strategy that you can use to find the solutions to a quadratic equation, but sometimes it's helpful to look at the structure of the equation to decide which strategy to use. 
In the try it portion for the second learning objective for this week, you're asked to solve the quadratic equation and provide a written justification for why you selected the method that you used. So remember, we have a lot of methods that we can use to solve quadratic equations. So if I look at this first example, 2x squared equals 72, I'm going to solve that quadratic equation and I'm going to identify the method that I used and the reason why I used it. You might talk a little bit about how the structure of the equation helped you, um, whether or not you like a particular strategy more than another or any other reason why you decided to solve that equation that way. Second mini lesson, you learned how to use the best method based on the structure of a quadratic equation in order to solve the equation. I think that we can give this learning outcome a nice big green check. Nice job! Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of Algebra 1 BCPS TV Style. I enjoy teaching all of you in my brand new virtual classroom. This week, I want to challenge you to try to find someone at home to show all the things that you've learned about this week. You might even encourage them to try some of the Think About It tasks. Also, make sure you pick up a good book. I know I have a stack of books that I can't wait to dig into this week. And finally, remember that when you smile, the world smiles with you. Have a great week, everyone.